Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Meng Cheng. I'm the John A. Everson Dean of the College of Engineering at Great Purdue University. And tonight is very special night. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what a contrast compared to just one week ago. Uh, the temperature difference is quite remarkable. And uh, well, tonight uh, we have this full house of attendance. And I hope that uh, we all appreciate tonight is special because of the nature of the event, because of the keynote speaker tonight, and also because of what his accomplishments symbolize for the diverse student population we have here at Purdue Engineering. Now, may I start by highlighting, if you haven't noticed yet, that uh, we are celebrating a birthday, 150th birthday, and the celebration is longer than one year. Uh, so thank goodness uh, our birthdays uh, don't deserve such a long celebration. But yes, Purdue, 150 is certainly, certainly, we have a lot to look forward to. And there's Mr. Dan Hessler, the birthday boy who architects the entire, the entire year-long outstanding celebration. And part of that is Idea Festival. I see my great colleague, Mark Lundstrom. I don't know if Chris Laddish is here as well, leading the university-wide Ideas Festival, the intellectual heart and brain of Purdue Cisco Centennial. And as a part of that, the College of Engineering is proud to starting today, present the Engineering 2169 series of four days of events. And there's Stephanie and Kelly from the college. Thank you. We have in each of the four days, four components a graduate student ideas competition on how are we going to live and eat and work and play 150 years from today, a poster session highlighting the research by our graduate students. And we love to highlight our wonderful master and PhD students in the college. And a keynote speech followed by a faculty panel. And now we're entering those two components for the very first part of Engineering 2169 on the theme of sustainability. And the keynote speaker tonight is one of our own boilermakers. And Dr. Jorge Hedick is is a boiler maker. He received his PhD in industrial engineering from Purdue in 1981. He was born and raised in Puerto Rico. He went through, like many of us, the students at this great land grant university, the struggles in order to make it. And he did remarkably well at Puerto Rico and then as a master's student at RPI, and then upon realizing that Indiana is warmer, came over to Purdue to pursue his PhD. And he was then back at RPI as a faculty member and associate dean in the College of Engineering before becoming a dean at two other American institutions, and then returning from England to the island back to Puerto Rico as the president of University of Puerto Rico, which is the flagship university system on the island. And as we all know that there is a lot of challenges and opportunities in Puerto Rico. And in regards to renewable energy, tonight we'll hear from President Haddock of the potential future. What if the world runs 100% on renewable energy? And what if Puerto Rico becomes an island of test bed. Now, before I hand it over to President Haddock, however, with his permission, I'm proud to review a wonderful number here and announce an exciting initiative. As you know that we have many students from many different backgrounds in this large college of engineering, the largest among the top 10, 
uh, engineering schools in the United States. And as we aspire to the pinnacle of excellence at scale, we value the contribution by everyone. And this year, for the first time ever, the Hispanic Latino students population has a five-year graduation rate that is higher than the average five-year graduation rate in the college. First time ever. <laughs> to those who are in the audience and to those who are watching the streaming or maybe the archival later, to those who are in the student organizations, we are immensely proud of all of you. And indeed, yes, this is being streamed live to all the alumni around the world as well tonight. And I am going to tweet about it too. Uh, and tonight, we also announce this major push and initiative to raise more graduate student fellowships for both Hispanic, Latino students from United States different parts of it, including Puerto Rico, as well as for international students from Latin American countries. And we need your help to work together towards that goal. However much you could contribute, the please think about the future, not only 100% potentially on renewable energy, but also where we have even more than 445 undergrads today and 96 graduate students today who are Hispanic Latino students and many more from Latin American countries. And imagine this future where all of them are given this opportunity at this great land grant university to pursue their dreams, just like our keynote speaker tonight has pursued his and translated that into societal goods. Please warmly welcome back our alumni, President Jorge Haddock. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, what an audience. What an audience. I was expecting to have three chairs, people sitting here in the front, three people, but this is amazing to have so many of you. That's the best joke I have all night, by the way. <laughs> So I'm so glad to be back at my alma mater after so many years. And I thank you, thank you, Dean, and so many people who uh, have welcomed me here today. And as he said, I'm here only because of the generosity of the system in which I, was, I went as an undergraduate. The University of Puerto Rico is a great uh, place of mobility, social and financial mobility for the people on the island like me. I was, born, I was, I was raised by a divorced mom of th with three children. I could not have gone to university had it not been to the University of Puerto Rico. And when I, went, when I came to Purdue, tuition was more than my mom made in a year. So I could not have come to Purdue if it wasn't for the generosity of so many people who supported me, including my advisor, Tom Sparrow, who may be somewhere in the audience here tonight. So uh, Tom, hey Tom. So let's, let's give him a hand. And today, I would have never thought I would be the president back on the island very briefly. I've I spent 34 years on the mainland, and uh, I, I looked at people going after the hurricane. First Irma and then Maria, and I was watching from Boston on the, on the, on the TV, not knowing how my family was doing. And not to thought that I had the opportunity to go back and make a difference on the island after the hurricane. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in the context of, of renewable energy and what it is to be back on, on such a beautiful island and be able to contribute back to the re, um, rebuild, the rebuilding of the, of the island and the university. So let me uh, tell you about what tonight, the things we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm not supposed, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. What am I doing? <laughs> there you go. So tonight I'll be talking about the challenges that we're facing, that humanity is facing today. And uh, we're going to be asking the question, can renewable energies be the solution? 
uh, what is the potential for Puerto Rico, the rest of the Caribbean, and the world. And then we're going to draw some conclusions. But before we do that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the University of Puerto Rico. Look at that beautiful, beautiful building. It's a signature building of the entire university. Uh, we have 11 campuses all around the island. Uh, we have an enrollment of more than 56,000 students. The university is 115 years old, actually 116 years old. Uh, we have 152 programs, and you can read the rest. So it's, it's a very comprehensive university. We have um, the, the, the flagship is in Rio Piedras in San Juan, which is uh, a very traditional liberal arts institution. But we also have architecture. We have law. We have, um, obviously, an accredited business school. We have a medical school. And then on the west coast, we have a land grant, which would be the Purdue of, um, of, of Indiana with uh, all the engineering and agricultural engineering programs on the west coast. We, have, we are a traditional university. When, when I first came here, I remember seeing, for some reason, I, it stuck on me that Purdue always talks about teaching, research, and service. For some reason, that's a theme that I remember being at Purdue. And that's the same thing that happens at my alma mater. We are about teaching. We have some of the best teaching programs uh, in, in the US. We are about research. We, we do research like we do at Purdue that is transforming the world, where there is cancer, HIV, or any of the other impactful research that we do, and then we do service. The university has a, uh, an extensive agricultural service um, uh, offices all over the island and many other services that we do at the island. So we are, like Purdue, a traditional university in that sense. So enough about that. Actually, before I finish with the university, we have a uh, a couple of renewable energy programs at the university. And here we have, for example, INESI is, is a, again, is a program that encompasses teaching, research, and service to the island on the renewable energies. And Professor Luciano Castillo from Mechanical Engineering, who had, he was the one who invited me here tonight. He's been working with INESI uh, and, and, and their programs. We have also a proposal that we're working on on the, uh, for the ERC, which is an NSF Engineering Research Center for Renewable Energy. And of course, the, one of the major partners on that proposal would be uh, is Purdue University, some other universities that aspire to be like Purdue and, and UPR, correct? Now you're getting my sense of humor. It takes a while. <laughs> and then we're talking about harnessing the fundamental knowledge and expertise needed to design a resilient coastal communities of the future. It's amazing, you're paying more attention than my students do. I don't know, you have to tell me what am I doing right here tonight. <laughs> students don't pay so much attention to me. So uh, let's talk about some of the energy challenges facing humanity. We have uh, population growth. We have uh, pollution and greenhouse gases. Climate change. And upcoming water crisis, even on the island we have some serious crisis, uh, uh, water, uh, water crisis. And the limited conventional energy sources. So those are some of the challenges that we're facing in humanity today and then the inadequate infrastructure. When you think about the infrastructure, Maria, we're going to see some slides. Maria took 100% of the energy infrastructure, electrical infrastructure on the island, 100%. And there are many other islands that storm after storm, the infrastructure is, is totally devastated by storms. But we build the same infrastructure time and time again. So I don't know what's going to take for us to learn from, from, from the past. So here's a population growth. And here you see, uh, many of you have seen this before, how this um, reflects the um, availability of electricity and some of what people could call modernization in the world. So you could see how that is reflected on that slide. And also the population growth, where the population is growing. So here we have some, some models. Uh, we have even the most conservative or the most pessimistic model, which would be the one on the bottom, it still has some significant population growth. And then you see some of the other forecasts or models that are much more aggressive and perhaps more, um, uh, I would say, concerning 
than the conservative model. Here we have uh, the energy and the access to the energy. So you have here the millions of people who lack adequate electricity would be in, in, in the uh, Purdue Gold. And then the millions of people who have no electricity that would be in, in the red. So here you have the, what it shows is that three and a half billion people lack proper access to electricity all around the world. That's a lot of people, three and a half billion people who lack proper access to electricity. Whereas we have all this renewable energy available to us, we still have no way of providing that energy to most of the population of the world. So then here what we see is the water reserves. We have um, that there's 100% of the water, the, the available water in the world, most of that is saline. Is that how you pronounce it? Salina? In Spanish? Fresh water is, is just a fraction, two and a half. So 97.5 is salted water, right? Two and a half percent is fresh water and less than 1% is accessible. And I know some of you may think this, this is alarming, but it is alarming. This is, this is, this, these are facts about the water sources in the world. And that's the, the volume of the Earth. So here what we have is some, some of this in Spanish. I just want to make sure that, that you are paying attention. So here he talks is about some of, the, um, some of the crisis in Cuba. One of the worst droughts in history in Cuba. Look at the, at the level of how the water is reflected there. Bolivia. Water crisis in Bolivia. California drought. That's English, by the way. It is even worse than you think. And then Peru back in Spanish. 17 regions are in, in emergency, in, emer in crisis. So this is global. This is all over. So what we have here is the access to water in the world, or the drought. So look at how the number of months in which water is scarce, and look at how I would say most of the world is, is in scarcity of water, or at least a significant portion of the world is in scarcity of water. So um, again, population, here what you have is Cape Town, South Africa, how the lack of water is reflected in that picture. Two thirds of the world population can face the same problem that Cape Town is facing, reflected on that picture by 2025. So here what we have is another picture of what's going on in the world, the U.S. water withdraw, uh, withdrawal by the, by the sectors in 2010. So livestock, self-supply domestic, mining, public irrigation. And notice to the right how thermoelectric power uh, combined with irrigation is taking about 80% of the water in the world, of the water in the world. I think that's also concern provoking, at least for me, how much electricity we use, I mean, water we use for just power, it's thermoelectric power. So percentage wise, again, 11.8 11 11 .8 would be public, which is one of the largest, and close to 80% would be irrigation and, and thermoelectric power. So what we have here now is, is that the glacier, this glacier that has 14 billion tons of ice, 
if we, once that disappears or melts, it estimated that about two feet of the ocean uh, would be lifted. I mean, that could really cover many, many towns, including the city of Boston where I used to live. Thank God I'm, I'm about to sell my condo there because it may disappear in a couple of years. So let's talk about Maria for a moment and not my wife. My wife's name is Maria, by the way. Now I tell people, now you know what it is to be married to Maria for 40 years. <laughs> Just look, at the, look what Maria did to the island. So we had a 100% collapse of the infrastructure, especially water, I mean electricity, 100% collapse. And the university alone, the total losses accounted to $140 million. Actually, FEMA estimates, we estimate that FEMA is going to give us, at the end of the day, $2.5 billion in damages to the university. That's the latest estimate we have. And this is over a year ago, and we're still, we're still doing the estimates. But the latest estimate we had was $2.5 billion in devastation. One of the smallest campuses on the, on the East Coast which is also the one who, where the hurricane came in, so it was the most devastation. That campus alone, one of the smallest, is $282 million in damages. So the whole university system not only collapsed, infrastructure-wise. We came back in two months, and some of you may know that some of the universities on the mainland, when we had similar, similar um, disasters, it took them a year or, or longer to to recover. Well, the, the, the campus of the 11 that took the longest took only two months to recover. But nevertheless, it's still not fully recovered, and we're still estimating the um, uh, money we're going to get from FEMA, and like I said a couple, of, a couple of seconds ago, is going to be over $2.5 billion and growing. So here you have, uh, before the storm on the top left, on the northwest, you have uh, the storm came where the, the, the red line is. Uh, that's where the storm, the path of the storm, but it was the, the width wise, it, took in, it covered the entire island. The width of the storm covered literally the entire island. So four months to the storm would be on the south southwest, uh, and then this is six months after the storm. So it took about six months for the entire island to come back. And still today you go over and I have a, a year and a half later, and not all the traffic lights are working. So it's taking, it's taking forever to recover. So then the question that, that most of us came here to, to look at or to address is, can renewable energies be the solution? Well, we have a governor who says that restoring the electricity grid has become his, his mission in life. He's not more something, he's not something that he has to do anymore is his mission in life. So at the university, we, we made it our, our mission to restore the electricity, to restore the, 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 the power grid. But if you think about the devastation that it caused, um, the problems, other problems did not start with the storm, but they just got worse with the storm. Less than 10% of the food consumed on the island comes from the island. Less than 10% of the, the poultry, the fish, imagine an, an island, less than 10% of the fish comes from the island. Poultry, you name it, meat, beef, comes from the mainland. Most of it comes from the mainland or, or, or surrounding countries. So the university has made it its mission to become, to have Puerto Rico become self-sustained in, in all those areas by the year 2025. But the one that brought us here is the energy, the energy, the energy grid. So can en wind energy, solar energy, hydropower, geothermal energy, and other sources can become the solution. So when Professor Castillo invited me to create this center that I'm going to be speaking briefly in a moment, he didn't know that 40 years ago, Professor Sparrow had funded my research on energy planning for Puerto Rico. He didn't know that. So 40 some years ago, I was working with Professor Sparrow in this problem, and of course in 40 years the technology has evolved a lot, and it's come a long way. And 
in looking at this from a different angle, what we have here is that the jobs generated in a 100% renewable world would create those, um, those would be the, the percentages available to us today. So natural gas, 21%, oil is 31%, nuclear is 4.8, and so on. You know, in Puerto Rico, 99% of the energy comes from, from um, oil, 99%. So we only have um, uh, pe petrol energy and a little bit of less than 1% is hydro. No nuclear on the island. So imagine we have all this energy and, and this, these numbers are changing very quickly. Uh, so I have to update the numbers because solar energy is, is starting to penetrate finally after the storm. So hypothetically, 100% renewable world would create about 200 million jobs, directly and indirectly. So here what we have is a summary. The impact, if we had 100% renewables in the world, these obviously are estimates, and these are done mostly, a lot of this is done by Luciano Castillo's research. So we would have 200 million jobs available. 75% would be wind, this would be the assumption. And 19% would be solar, 6% would be geo. Jobs, if we had 50% solar energy and 50% wind energy production, we ended up with 500 million jobs. If we reduce the greenhouse gases by 45,000 uh, metric tons, and then the water savings could be 1,600 trillion, ga trillion gallons of water per year. And that could be done easily. That's obviously in a hypothetical world. So when you think about the world and the wind speed, look at that, and, and if you see, um, it's difficult to, I don't know, I don't have the pointer here, I think, but you can see Puerto Rico in yellow, in that yellow area over there, just, just to, the, to the southwest of the yellow area. And look, a lot of wind is available on the island. And all we need is four to six um, mile per, per second winds to be able to generate the energy. So this is the irradiation available in the world. Even Indiana has some sunlight. Maybe you forgot. <laughs> Maybe you forgot we get some sunlight here. So then the potential for Puerto Rico and the rest of the Caribbean, again on wind, solar, hydro, and geo, there's Puerto Rico, and then I'm going to give you another hypothetical case. You have Puerto Rico there uh, in, in, the, uh, in the red circle. Those are the winds. The winds on the Caribbean come from the east, differently than on the mainland that come from the west, for most part, if they come from the east. And that's not a Van Gogh painting, by the way. Those are the winds. So those are the, that's the distance between some, some segments, some islands, and some of the uh, continent to the island. That's the distance in miles and kilometers. So potentially you can create a grid to take advantage of all these wind and solar energy. You can create a mini grid, or maybe not so mini, not so micro grid of energy that would be renewable energy. And I may have, so you can imagine here that we have a, a grid of energy generated that could then also be projected to the mainland. In this case, it could be Florida, but not only that, you can so also th see this as a way of creating an experiment. So what the Dean said is that one of the ideas that we have with the Institute is that the island could, be not, only, could, could not only benefit from this renewable energy, but can become the test bed of all these technologies that then could be used, obviously, in the rest of the US, but especially in the rest of the world. 
So for those of us who are thinking about this from a financial, from an economic point of view, this is not only a uh, environmentally, environmental um, concern or an environmental point of view, but also a financial point of view. Because this technology could be generated in such a way that could not only save, save some, some money, generate jobs, uh, but also save the environment. So I think that whether uh, you're looking at this from a, from a financial or economic point of view or an environmental point of view, I think that this is a, this is a solution that could really uh, be attracting to all points of views, all points of view. So in conclusion, nothing surprising here for many of you. You know, the population growth will continue to cause increased competition for national resources. Some people say, if you want to make money, buy, buy water, invest in water. And, and many people are investing in water. In water. Uh, traditional energy sources release pollutants, contribute to climate change, and withdraw excessive amounts of water. Renewables are the way to save water and reduce the impact certain as in certain aspects of the environment. Inadequate infrastructure is a big problem in many locations, including Puerto Rico, like I said. We keep, all this uh, infrastructure keeps being devastated, but FEMA, for example, requires that we build back to the way it was before, rather than allowing us to build in a way that is more resilient. So we need to learn how to build more resilient infrastructure, no matter which way we go. Last but not least, It can be an alternative that should be explored in Puerto Rico, not only for Puerto Rico's sake, but also as a test bed for the rest of the world. Uh, we have a lot of favorable conditions to uh, make the change towards renewable energy, not only in the Caribbean, but in the rest of the world. It has some environmental and economic advantages. And although it is not a panacea, because it has some disadvantages, it's danger to the fauna, aesthetic space, remains vulnerable to atmospheric, atmospheric phenomena, but still has so many advantages that it should be, they're worth exploring. So with that, I hope I have, I have caused you, I have been thought provoking, and uh, I hope that we can have um, a conversation about the need for renewable energy the need for redundancy and backup uh, so that we do not rely on just one source of energy as a panacea. And I hope that we can have a conversation for the next few minutes before we start the panel. So with that, uh, I'd like to finish my presentation and open the floor for any questions. Thanks, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a question over here. How are we going to store it? That's one of the big questions. Yes, and, and that's one. Thank you for the question. Did everybody hear the question, how are we going to store the energy? And I think that's an, an area of research, very active research. On the island, for example, we have a lot of the private companies are creating their own microgrids um, for obvious reasons. And then one of the major concerns that they have in creating that microgrid is, is storage for off-peak off or when, we, when you don't have enough energy. So the Technology is available, but like every, every other technology in renewables, uh, it requires a lot of continued research and, and development. Thank you for the question. Good question. Yes. Thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation. Thank you.
population growth, which is one of the problems that you identified uh, in the discuss, uh, maybe isn't as big of an issue as we think it is if we think more creatively about how the resources on the planet for food and water actually exist to, to, to feed or to water people, um, like Dr. Mr. Fuller uh, discussed in some of his work. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, again, I, I do believe that well, I think most people would agree that there's no one simple answer to what you said, and I would welcome any of the experts in, in the audience to, to help me with this, with this answer, but I think that this is more of a matter of, of philosophy and, and policy than, than technology. When you think about how we're going to grow, go from a certain infrastructure that is being built based on these fossil fuels to the infrastructure that is going to be needed for the renewables, that's not a simple simple answer, there's not a simple approach to this. Also, there's some um, commercial concerns that I think are important, the investments that, that countries, cities, companies are made in, in all these technologies, in all the infrastructure. So I think that is a matter of, of planning, having a policy of planning for the future, and then looking at this from a holistic point of view, not only on a, on a city or case by case basis, but globally. And as we shift the use of water from, from certain uses to other uses, and as we shift from the fossil fuels to the renewables, then it has to, it, it is going to be a transition. Uh, but it's going to take policy and a philosophical approach, mostly from the government, to be able to get there. I mean, technologically it's been proven it could be done. But again, I think that the question is by when and how much we're going to spend in, build, in building that infrastructure. Companies are doing this, by the way, and see, there's, there's a, a group of uh, small towns in Puerto Rico who are cre creating their own microgrid. They're going off the grid, part, uh, pardon the redundancy, creating their own microgrid, and they're doing this on their own. They're not waiting for central government to do it. So I think that the policies could be created at the local level, as is happening in many parts of the world. We don't have to wait for the, for the uh, I would say, national governments to, to, to build that policy. And companies are doing that too, as I mentioned earlier. Well, thank you for the question. And thank you for calling me an expert. I mean, as a president, no one calls me an expert on anything. <laughs> yes, any other questions? Yes, back there. Well, I, I don't, I think, I personally don't think that the solutions would be different. I think it's a matter of, of what's available in the different parts of the world. So we didn't talk about Puerto Rico the, because of the way that the, uh, that the um, ocean, the depth of the ocean is, goes very, how you say, the slope is very um, sharp. It's great, great slope. Steep. Steep, thank you. So I, I never knew English, and I'm forgetting the little I knew. So um, <laughs> after being on the island for five months. So because the, the slope is so steep, you, you can really do the, the, the high, the, uh, the, um, those turbines in, in the ocean that we did not bring up. We don't have a lot of research yet. We're studying that research. But anyway, I think that the, the answer would be that the solution would be the same. The question is, what's available where? in terms of the, of the solar available, wind available, hydro available, but the solutions I think would be, would be similar or the same no matter where you're in the world. Okay, so thank, thank you for the question. You had a, somebody raised, yes. Well, so the que if, I under if I heard the question, so you're talking the wind is coming from the east. Yeah. So the, the, the cities on the east would benefit from the wind coming from the east. What happens to the cities from the west? Is that, is that the question? Yes, it's okay. Oh, so if you're talking about different countries like in Europe. Well, I think, I think that uh, that's policy. Okay? That's, I think, cooperation between the countries as you implied. I think that we would have to create a, a grid uh, that would 
would be conducive to to the, being able to distribute the energy in a way that is av available to everybody. I mean, as as you may know, now many of the uh, grids allow you to sell. If you're an individual or a company, you can sell the energy back to the grid. So there's been a lot of um, creativity in financial models to, to really encourage people, individuals, companies to go to renewables and to sell the excess of the renewable back to the grid. And I, I don't think that, could be, that would be the exception. Okay? Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, one point which I understood from your talk is that it's very like, optimistic in adopting renewable energy in the future. But my question is that, and which you also mentioned, is it, there's a slight disadvantage, which is like the world will become prone to some atmospheric uh, issues and all. So from the point of view of the industries, will they be eager to adopt this renewable energies as fast as we expect now? Because there's also a cost and a risk associated with that. So how are you going to like explain that? So if, if I heard you correctly, you're saying if, so would there be some disadvantages because of the cost of these renewables? Yes. 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 So yes, we we have some risk in that some of these uh, technologies are not um, uh, indestructible. Uh, Obviously, the if you have the wind turbines, they're also exposed to the wind, and there's some some risk and danger. And and solar panels. I mean, obviously, we had we people lost a lot of solar solar panels. Uh, when we had the, the, the storms in Puerto Rico and some of them had not been able to be replaced because of the uh, expense or because there's, there's no, they're not available yet. But uh, I think that there's also technology now that they're creating better and better technology that is more and more, uh, less and less vulnerable to atmospheric, atmospheric conditions. And at the same time, I, I still believe, and that's one of the, the last points that I made, that in most cases, at least in the, in the uh, next future, in the near future, we may have to build some redundancy and backup systems using the traditional grid. I think that companies uh, are moving into these uh, microgrids mostly because of, um, they tend to be more reliable. They, they, are in, they, they can control that better than if they're relying on a, on a national grid or on a larger grid. Uh, so they tend to be more reliable. Now they're working on the storage part, but if anything fails, they still need the backup and vice versa. So I, I think that we're going to, at least in the near future, we're going to have to rely on some redundant systems um, to, be, to be able to, measure, especially for companies who need that energy or for hospitals. I mean, you can imagine in, when we had Maria, you may have seen this in the news. We had hospitals with no power, with no backup and people died, or people had to be moved from the hospital. So there's many reasons for this. It's not only comfort, but also safety. Yes. Hello, sir. My name is Sai. Uh, coming from a country like India, we dependent on natural resources a lot. I feel like there's uh, a couple of problems regarding 100% renewable energy. One is the cost factor, like the money that has to be on, and also the people's involvement. So what, what we are going to do in so the, you said the cost? And the people's involvement. Like, how are you going to create awareness among people? Like, a like lot of people can't afford a lot of the technology. So if we are, if, for example, Puerto Rico itself is going into a 100% renewable energy uh, country, <coughs> what, are, uh, what is the involvement that people have to do? Or just to say? Well, yeah, I mean, yes. I think if, if I understood your question, and if one point of view would be, if you look at the return on investment on solar panels, for example, is about seven to eight years on the average. And uh, if you go to Puerto Rico, maybe a little bit lower because we have so much sunlight. But still, there's a multi-year uh, return on investment. But there, there's, there's not only the financial aspect. You, you, some people would really think about the environmental aspect. They may take a little bit longer. It may not be only money, but it may be also contributing to the planet. Even, even if it's financial, you can still get the return on investment. The question is by when. You can also create some, some incentives for um, some companies. 
we, we had a company who would come and on a related issue, they would, they would take the entire campus and with no money from the university, they would, they would convert it to LED and then they would take 50%, 60% of the savings. So they invest all the money, we invest zero money and we keep 40% of the savings. So um, there may be some financial opportunities for people to invest and, and to, to incentivize some individuals or companies to invest in, in, in these renewables. Uh, and I think that for the individual, there are also, as you may know, many cities and towns are, are providing tax incentives also for uh, people to invest in renewable energy. So there may be, again, it's more about policy and philosophy than financial, but even if it's financial, you can still get some benefits or it could be environmentally uh, you, because you're environmentally conscious, then that could be another benefit. Yes. Well, I think FEMA, for most part, would would have you build to what it was before. So I think that, again, I'm not an expert on FEMA. I don't want to get in trouble with FEMA. I don't want them to take away any money. Anyone from FEMA here, by the way? It's being streamed. It's being streamed. I have to be careful. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> but for most part, they, you have to build to what it was. So you have to be careful. But we can still be, uh, I think we, we, we can invest as a system, in my case, as a university system, in, on the renewables. Uh, and again, we're doing that with some private companies in some areas. I gave you the example of the LED, for example, uh, as an example. So I think that is a multi, is a is a three prong approach: government, private, and then we as an university investing our own money. Yes. Is the microgrid 100% renewable? Yeah. And what was a Well, the companies that, that I've spoken to on the island, 100% uh, is renewable sol solar. Uh, they're building, like I said, they're working on the storage. That, that would be for whatever extras they, they have during the day for, to, to be used at night or, or on cloudy days. And the backup would be just a traditional grid. So when, every, when they run out of energy, then they go to the, to the, you know, to the um, island grid to go to the public utility. Coal. No, in our case, it's, it's oil. oil. It's, yeah, petrol. We don't have coal on the island, for better or for worse. Don't comment. <laughs> I, I'm not a politician. I play one on TV. <laughs> Any other questions? Question. Uh, you mentioned uh, Tom Spado. Yes. And uh, Tom, of course, but, yes. Uh, not to praise him because he is in the audience, but otherwise, he has provided uh, through his career both public administrator and one who uh, has been in the administration manager of the Universal Project. Uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, are there such organizations? So that's one question. The other is should that model be practiced? All 50 states would utilize that type of uh, academic input into policies or uh, better management of. Uh, sure. Did everybody hear him? No. Well, he he first praised my for my advisor Tom Sparrow as as rightly so, and he said that Tom has served uh, the university very well, paraphrasing him, and also that he served the state of Indiana well through some economic forecasting. And before I go into the second part, I'd like to say that perhaps um, serve servingly, I said that we always turn out to be like, a, like our advisors. And I say self-servingly because obviously Tom Sparrow has been such a great professional, professor, human being. But I like to think that I turn out to be like Tom in everything that he did. So Tom, if that's the case, this is you. <laughs> I, am, I am a reflection of you. 
I'm sorry. If, if that's the case, I'm a reflection of you. Whatever I'm, I'm not able to live up to, I apologize, because you were a great role model to me. So let's give him another hand, please. <laughs> then the second part of the question was, should other states endorse or espouse the same approach? And I would say yes. I mean, when I was in Virginia, we had some of the most famous uh, uh, economists were also serving the, uh, serving the state of Virginia and the D.C. area with some of the forecasts. We had that in San Juan, in Puerto Rico, and, and so on. So I think that's something that is, is well needed. We have great experts. Uh, Tom was an economist and as an operations researcher, which is a very uh, uncommon combination, and he served him and he served the, the, the world very well. So yes, by all means, uh, we need more of that. And, we say, some people say, because we're not able to forecast the future, that doesn't give us an excuse not to plan it. So we should plan the, the future regardless of our ability to forecast it perfectly. So I saw a hand, yes, sir. Yes, I think that that's something that Professor Castillo would not like to hear, right, Castillo? But uh, I, I think that's something, like I said, one of, perhaps I take this to a fault as an engineer, is that we, we learn, one of the principles in engineering is that everything, everything, everything has disadvantages, right? There's always advantages and disadvantages. So there's disadvantages, I say, and I mentioned a few, space, most of these, Technologies take space, they're not pretty, uh, they, uh, they can cause harm to the fauna, and on and on, and that could be one of them. So I think that's why we need to continue to create a balance into uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, of all these technologies. Of course, Professor Castillo is going to defend himself. He can't help himself. <laughs> stand, stand up, Luciano, stand up. And, and, and I would say study mechanical engineering under Luciano Castillo. That's the best way to go if you're interested in this field. <laughs> He's an endowed chair. Okay. Uh, I was going to add one other thing. So, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so we happen to have a time in the I think we have time for one last question, correct? Any last? Yes, over there. And then two. We'll go over here. Yes. Back there. Uh, hi, I'm actually from Puerto Rico. Uh, my question is regarding um, the census. Um, you guys keep talking about creating a microgrid for two remote islands. I know that this is the opposite of Puerto Rico, the Diego Santiago. Are there some efforts to try to create a microgrid there to try to build upon that as we, uh, as we try to explore and try to create a grid in the city? Well, we, we have this on, on plan. The, the pr Professor Castillo had, had approached us and, and we're creating a center, a UPR, Purdue, University of Puerto Rico Purdue Center. And it's going to go from idea creation all the way to, to manufacturing and everything in between. We're thinking about having, as I said earlier, a test bed, because there you have an island. The University of Puerto Rico, we literally have more, well, I haven't done the study, but I would say we, we may have more land than the, than the Vatican. And the, we own the entire island. We have, come on guys, you, you lost the sense of humor? <laughs> it took an hour for you to, to lose the sense of humor? 
<laughs> so um, anyway, we have a lot of land, we have a lot of infrastructure, we have a lot of talent. So we can really create this microgrid as an experiment. And you can imagine companies went now with, the, with all the tax incentives. Puerto Rico is an opportunity cost, 97% or so of the island. There's no, and this is an infomercial, I'm gonna give you, give me 30 seconds for an infomercial, but this would be a great investment opportunity for some of you. There's no place on earth that has the tax incentives for anyone in the US than Puerto Rico. I mean, this is literally the truth. It's an opportunity cost, you get 95% tax incentives for investing on the island. So you can imagine all these companies coming to the island and investing and experimenting and creating, they say, they, Professor Luciano uh, Castillo often talks about Tesla creating the first uh, truck, uh, uh, solar truck on the island and on and on. So you can imagine the possibilities are limitless. And then along the way, we create some experiments, we, create, we get the data and, and the possibilities are infinite, infinite possibilities. So we, we have not started to create that yet, but that's part of the plan and that's part of the institute, okay? So thank you for the question. And one last question over here. Okay, well, I was going to say a joke, but this is too serious for me to say a joke. I was gonna say that I have four and a half years left in my contract. I hope it doesn't happen within the next four and a half years, but that's not, this is not a good timing for a joke. But anyway, I think that um, if, if, the, if a hurricane hits the island right now, I think it would be absolutely devastating. We, we have not recovered completely yet. Like I told you, not even all the traffic lights are working. I mean, we have, you can go through the island. They, this, we are resilient as, 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 as people. I mean, I, I walk into most of our 11 campuses and you can hardly notice that we had a storm and that we're not fully back and we had not gotten much of the FEMA money back. But still, we are still very, very, very fragile. And if another storm would hit, it would be absolutely devastating. So uh, I think that, um, I mean, we can only hope there's not, there's not much beyond what we're already doing that we could do, but uh, I think it would be, and, and this had not happened in 80 years. So, I mean, the probabilities are really very low that it'll happen, and we're working very hard to be ready for the next storm. And as you know, just to finish, as you know, we, we had spent all this energy, it's been documented that we have spent all this energy as a country in, in planning for, for this uh, uh, devastate, devastating hurricanes but not much had been done in recovering from the storm. So I think now as an island, we have created a lot of recovery plans. I have to have as a president of the university in every campus, they have to have their own recovery plan. The island, the government has their own plan. So we're a little bit better prepared than in the past, but infrastructure wise, we're not even close to being ready. So thank you for the question. Anyway, so we're set, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we are now going to bring, begin the uh, second half of uh, tonight's event, uh, the panel portion of the Engineering 2169 and Ideas Festival. My name is John Sutherland. I am head of the, let me put the picture up. One more. I'm head of environmental and ecological engineering at Purdue, and I will be serving as the moderator for this evening's panel. Uh, let me invite uh, President Haddock to, to, uh, to rejoin us for the panel discussion along with three additional experts from Purdue University. All right. So joining uh, President Haddock uh, on the panel, our first panelist is Professor Maureen McCann. So let's hear it for Maureen McCann. We got him. There we okay. go. 
So we're all good, proud Purdue scientists and engineers, and we know that correlation does not equal causation. But it is really difficult to look at the chart that is to your left on this slide and not to draw the conclusion that global wealth, as the y-axis portrays in trillions of dollars, is not strictly correlated with energy consumption on the x-axis. If we burn fossil fuels, we get richer. And so how will we decouple? How will we decouple our e economic growth, our economic sustainability from the burning of fossil fuels? Because if we take a leap of imagination and think about, for example, the future of oil in 150 years, then the chart on the right is um, sourced from British Petroleum's Statistical Review of World Energy. So British Petroleum, BP, one of the largest oil companies in the world, and every year it does a survey of how much coal, oil, and gas remains in the ground as technically recoverable resources. So that's the highest bar. For oil, it is 2.6 trillion barrels. And then they calculate, based on current consumption rates, how long that oil would actually last. And they make a projection out, in the case of the middle bar, to 2035. And in the case of the, the furthest bar, 2015 to 2050. So what this chart says, by BP, is that by mid-century, half of our technically recoverable resource of oil will be consumed. In 2169, in our 150 years leap, oil doesn't have a future. And let's also think about the real cost of climate change. The US government released a report just before Thanksgiving and our own US government in its fourth national climate assessment, and this is a quote from the report, said there would be substantial net damage to the US economy in the absence of any mitigation or adaptation strategies that we might take. Billions of dollars, more than the GDP of many states. So this is the paradox, this is the challenge. Burning fossil fuels drives our economic growth globally, but by burning fossil fuels, we'll destroy our standard of living. So how is it that we are going to decouple this fossil fuel economy from global economic growth? So I'd like to put it to you that there is an opportunity for a new bio-based economy. And this sits on the progress made in a very quiet rev revolution over the last decade uh, that involves three different kinds of technology. First of all, very fast and cheap DNA sequencing. And you may have, some of you may have, taken advantage of this with 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. Then there is the ability to very precisely edit a gene within a living organism. And this gives us the ability, using the tricks and tools of molecular biology and genetic engineering, to enable our third leg of this revolutionary platform which is synthetic biology. It's the idea that we can take microbial organisms or living plant cells, and we can, using a knowledge base of biosynthetic pathways, co-opt those pathways to make unnatural products, to make products such as farnesine that can be used in jet fuels, or in the famous case, artemisinin as a, a cure for malaria. So that synthetic biology platform 
the fast and cheap DNA sequencing and our ability to use, for example, CRISPR technologies in gene editing is really starting to have a, a translational impact on the economy. One sixth of revenues from the US chemical uh, industry were from bio-based chemicals last year. The size of the bioeconomy in terms of fuels, in terms of chemicals, and in terms of materials and polymers that are made from those chemicals, uh, together with uh, pharmaceuticals, biopharma, food and feed products, that, economic, that e size of that economy was around $370 billion, a very conservative estimate of it. That's about the size of the semiconductor industry right now. So why is this better than using oil to produce our fuels and chemicals, the polymers and materials that we make from those chemicals, the things that we love that we then make from those materials, you know, sunglasses and golf balls and toothpaste and, and tents and my iPhone, which I do not want to give up. So why is this greener? Why is this better? It's because plants, the basis of this economy, are farmers. They farm carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at 400 parts per million, and they store that carbon dioxide as chemical energy in their own biomass, in their own bodies. And so even if you burn a biofuel, you are recycling captured carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You're not adding new carbon dioxide to that 400, million, uh, 400 parts per million burden. So the Department of Energy uh, estimates that there is at least 1 billion tons in the US of plant biomass that could be harvested on an annual basis in a sustainable fashion. If we think forward to 2169, and I think this is an achievable goal, if we can triple that and have 3 billion tons of biomass, we will displace our entire need for oil in the US. In 2169, that 3 billion tons of biomass is our new strategic carbon reserve. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCann. Um, let me now welcome Professor Luciano Castillo uh, up here to uh, say a little bit about himself as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think actually, and um, we start alluding to this issue of, of the, um, our dependence, actually, this, uh, I really need to thank, actually, my friend Jay Gore, he was the one that referred me to Gavisa Jeta. Before I joined Purdue, he invited me to give a talk in his department, his center, in agriculture for food security, and he was asking me, Luciano, can you talk about food security and make some connection with renewable energy? And I always open my big mouth and I say, yes. And <laughs> right, so then that meant that I had to go back and dig in a lot of the numbers in trying to make the connection between energy, food, and, and the water. And, and in the previous talk, we see that. And, and, and I agree with, with, with you, Maureen. We need to break our addiction to oil. We have to do that. And the major reason is this. This is from our article in Scientific American. And here what we show was that a lot of the renewable energy actually save water. Actually, this is a major point. And besides that, you create jobs. But very recently, we wrote this article in Axios. And this is the issue. And you could see these power plants. And the problem with them is that you actually are using a lot of the water. But you see these cracked regions of drought, right? And this is what I was pointing before. Imagine all of a sudden we have this major drought around the world and then start people moving from one region to the other. So now we, we want our oil, right? Because it's in the upper 80%. We want our oil dependence, and yet now we have to fight who gets the water and who owns that water. And this is why renewable has the biggest potential 
for our food security, but at the same time for our dependence uh, for, our, for our sustainability. You can see from here actually how we're using the water we drawn per day by different sectors. And, and you can see from this graph, this is the thermal power plant. These are the power plants. This actually is salt water, and all of this is fresh water. So basically, you're looking about 33% of our fresh water is being used for these power plants, and then this is irrigation. So I will agree that 32% to use for water, for food, it makes sense. It's good. I want to eat my nice juicy steak. But to use it for energy production, water for energy, this is the quiet crisis that I think we're facing right now, and the one that we have to do everything to avoid. If you start looking at the way that water for this different uh, energy sector is used, you can see nuclear energy uses the most. The part that, that I wanted to show you that is better, okay, these are the graphs from Scientific American, and sometimes they look kind of fancy, but I like my own graph. And you can see here, these are gallons for each megawatt hour that you need to use. You can see here nuclear energy, you have coal, you have biopower, natural gas, concentrated solar and geothermal, and all the way down. The message here is the following. All of these guys here are a bunch of dragons, right? They're a bunch of dragons. Why? Because you're using water to produce electricity. And in some cases, look at this, in Cape Town, you don't have the water in the first place, but you need the water to cool the power plant. So this is part of the problem. This is the water we draw. This is the water that is consumed. But the important aspect and the hope for wind energy is by the time you move down, you could actually see you're using negligible amount of water. And when you combine solar PV and wind, these two guys here offer great hope. So you could see the issue of the environment. There is there. We don't want to go after that. But it's the fact that the water preservation that renewable energy offers. And I, I would skip this one, but what I wanted to point out is this element, and I, I apologize for this. If you look in the US right now, natural gas, coal, and nuclear, these three produce 84% of electricity at a cost of 30 trillion gallons per year. Okay, 30. If you go to wind, you could see that, uh, and, and hydro, these are very small numbers, when you start going to small players, the production of electricity is very small, but they're using about one trillion with biopower wind being one of the water consumptions. Now, let me show you this because this is drought, and this is something that I, I have learned from some of my colleagues, including Dev, that is, I hope he's here. But this is a drought map by county. This is computed by our group, by every single county in the United States. You could see the most severe drought uh, I think this was for 18 years, and you could see the southwest region. Look at this here, okay? If you look at the solar irradiation in the United States, you could see, look at the southwest, go from Texas, start going all about the border, all the way you have one of the best regions for solar energy in the country, and yet they do not have water, right? And if you go out, look at the wind maps, you could see here, look at Texas again, we're going to focus here. And look at the best, this corridor this is one of the best wind corridor in the country, in the Gulf region, excellent wind resources, and in the West, in California, excellent wind. Now, why I'm showing you this? Because we have some crazy ideas that I've been working with some of my colleagues that are here. And this is this issue, right? Now, suppose we know all the Southwest of the United States, this is a cre present dilemma. And, and what you have is what? Well, in the Gulf, you have nice water, and you have nice wind. Well, what we're suggesting here, and this is actually, we want to engage some discussions, if you create a bunch of solar panels from border to border and wind energy, you could actually solve various problems, including the problem of water, right? Because now you could some, send water across the border. Now you could do agriculture in the desert. You have energy, and if you want your natural gas, you could still send it. So this is basically what I, I, I'm done with this. So I don't want to take a lot of time. But something that, I, that you want to see is that you could create way more jobs if you go to solar and wind than if you went, if you went to coal or, not, or even nuclear. You could see these numbers here. These numbers of jobs are very depressing. So thank you so much, OK?
Our uh, final panelist that will be joining us this evening, and while he's coming up, I, I will encourage you all to start thinking about your questions for the panel. Um, let's, let's welcome Professor Rakesh Agarwal. We have to get your picture up here, so. How many, uh, I always tell the students. Uh, yeah, well, we have to go through the backup. Yeah. There we go, all right. Thank you, John. Oh. Like, uh, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to be here. And thanks to all of you for staying and to hear all of us here. So I'll just quickly give you a brief introduction of what, uh, where the passion, my passion resides. OK, so this is a pointer. This is the one. OK. Ah, very good. OK, so, so, so what we do in my group, along with my graduate students, we do a lot of daydreaming. OK, so what uh, we talk about 2169, maybe even beyond. OK, if you get up one fine morning and uh, you have, there's no fossil. Okay. From the cup of my coffee, which I make in the morning, to my clothes, my transport, everything comes from solar photons. Okay? So wind is a part of that, but we really like to think, what would you do? Okay? How would you meet every need of yourself? Okay? Transportation, fertilizers, okay? chemicals, everything you do. Okay? And that's where we, as a team, like my team, the entire graduate student team, we spend a lot of time daydreaming. Okay? A great job to have, by the way. Okay? All right, so, so the question is for us is, so if you're going to do that, the, obviously, let's take a scenario where we're going to do it by PV panels. Okay? We're going to build PV. So the, so the first and the foremost question would be, is do we have, what is the performance of a PV panel? Okay? And now we have enough data. Like there are a lot of, when you land in Indianapolis airport, you see a PV farm. Okay? There's a lot of PV models which are installed. Right? So we can collect data all across the world. The hundreds of solar farms exist. Okay? And we can see their performance. Okay? So when you do that, what you very quickly find is that the power okay, from different solar, as you heard in the earlier talks, it varies from place to place. Okay? So if you are in the UK, okay, those, those pentagons okay, on the bottom, on bottom left, okay, the power you get from those solar parks is only 5 watts per meter square. Okay. Whereas in US, which are the, the dots on the rightmost side, you see it varies all the way from around 5 watts per meter square all the way to 11 watts per meter square. Okay. So how big is 5 watts per meter square or how, big, or how small is 5 watts per meter square? So I just looked before I came here, the LED bulb which my wife, Manju, who is also in the audience, happens to buy for home. Okay. And its rating is 11 watts. Okay. It's the LED bulb. Okay, and it gives me 65 watts of the old power. So if you're looking at, you're varying from 11 watts to 16 watts. And these solar pumps in UK can't even light one bulb which lights in my house. And they're, they're literally 50 plus bulbs in my house, if not more. Okay? So it tells you the situation. We are in a bad situation when we are relying on the solar energy to do that. So what that means is the average energy from a solar farm is anywhere between 5 to 11.5, and it is 7.5 is an average. So what does that mean? Okay? So that means if you look at a country like UK, or Germany, what you find is they need as a nation, as a nation based on their area, they need something like five watts per meter square. And here is my solar farm, which, okay, like, sorry, the solar farm is five watts per meter square, and their need as a country is 1.25 watts per meter square. So if I want to, so we can talk about all PV, okay, all day here, but if you want to supply, light up the whole UK with PV in 2169, 25% of the country will be covered by solar farm. Is that feasible? And that would be true for Germany too. Okay? And that's absolutely impractical, right? Because this, the urban, the cities, the Londons, okay? the, the cities like London, okay? and so forth, okay? is only 2% of the country. Same thing for us. It's only 2%, the Manhattans and all those things, they're only 2% of the country. So we keep talking about put it on the solar panel, on the house roof, rooftops. Forget it. Okay? We, have, we need a lot more area. Okay? So, if you look at our own country, look at the Indiana in the middle of the map, okay? So my graduate student, of course, have, you know, I'm taking credit for all this, okay? But I've done none of these work, okay? I just want to clarify to everyone, okay? So the, my graduate student who did this calculation, okay, what she did was, she said, okay, if in the state of Indiana, if I meet all my needs, so it is 2169, as Professor Maureen McCain said, and we are meeting all our needs by PV, how much energy would I need from that farm? And if you can see Indiana there, it is more than 11 watts per meter square. That means, I just cannot go in there, okay, with 
the urban area and the miscellaneous land area I have, and mind you, I can't put PV on the agriculture land. I can't supply even Indiana locally, okay? So even coming back to our own country and our own states, the situation is very, very challenging, okay? So what happens is that coupled with the lower power recovery, okay, there's a land constraint, okay? And the, so there is a competition between food and energy, and you heard about the water. It's a clear competition, okay? So I don't know about you, you heard about Luciano, like, you know, he would rather have his steak first, okay? I'm a vegetarian, but nevertheless, I would rather have my food first, okay? So, so there is a challenge, okay? So what do we do? So there are people like, for example, Fraunhofer in Germany, which have begun to install, as you see those solar panels, on the farmland, because we are not gonna have enough rooftops, we are not gonna have enough miscellaneous area, so what is left? Okay, let's put the PV modules on agriculture farm. What ha why would you so do so? Because now you can co-produce food, you can co-produce electricity. Looks like a very interesting and exciting thing to do, because we have windmills on the, on the, on the farms, right? You drive to in, to, towards Chicago, you see all this. So why not solar panels on the farm, okay? But it has the negative consequences. When they did that for an offer, what they found out was the soya bean, the potato, all those went down by 20%. And that's not a surprise. There's a lot of shadow under these things. So there's not enough photoradiation on the ground to grow the food. So there's a dear, clear challenge. If you want food, you can't put these things on the, on the farmland. If you want electricity, you need the area, additional land area. So what are you going to do, okay? So this is where we are at Purdue, okay? So at Purdue, what we have done is, in a remarkable, in the last two years, okay? The agronomist, okay, this is a great place to be, okay? We have a great engineering school, we have a great agricultural school. We have joined our forces together, and what we have done is, we are looking at it in a holistic manner. So people who do photovoltaics are here, people who grow food and do genetic modification, which Professor McCain talked about, they are here, not anymore. We are all in the same room. We are all on the same, same table, okay? And by the way, we are doing these experiments, and hopefully we'll be installing these things this spring, and hopefully in the summer we'll be doing these experiments at the acre farmland, and once we have it all, all done, okay, we'll find the solutions to grow food along with, the, along with the electricity which we need, and then manage the water, which he was talking about. Agriculture uses a lot of water. It's one of the big reasons for pollution. We see those algal blooms, which you see in the Lake Michigans and everywhere else, and we will manage, this is our vision. Okay, so 2169, we will live in harmony, okay? We will use the solar photons to grow food, use the windmills, which we don't show here, but we'll put some windmills here too. They will all coexist. And you see the solar panel on the rooftop on the left, at the bottom left? So we will have solar panels on the rooftops too, okay? But the, nevertheless, we will all share the photons equally and we'll live happily thereafter, okay? And, and that, that correlation which Professor McCain talked about between the GDP and the energy consumption will no longer be a problem, okay? So. What an amazing panel. Well, we have now gotten to the uh, portion of the evening where we're gonna open things up for audience questions and answers. Well, questions from the audience, answers from the panel. There are microphones down front. Remember, you will, will be uh, recorded and uh, you are being live streamed, so uh, use good judgment. Um, <laughs> Maybe while we're waiting for, for people to pile down here to the microphones, I will start off with a few questions of my own. So um, a, as you all think about the, the challenges with the, the various technologies, what are the specific issues that we should be working on to make renewable energy more competitive with fossil energy sources? Jorge, why don't we start with you and... Okay, hi, can you hear me? I think some of the, the primary issues I think have to, have to deal with policy when I'm being very careful in my, in my choice of words. Uh, we, we have to be concerned about the existing investment that has been made by companies, governments, individuals in transforming the infrastructure to uh, any, any new infrastructure that would be needed for, in, in this case, the renewable, the, the renewable energy. Obviously, we also have to continue to consider the cost of, uh, of, of some of these alternatives. And ultimately, uh, in, in somehow contradicting what I said, uh, in many cases, it cannot be about the finances. It has to be about the 
environmental concerns so about is about saving the environment ultimately. Marie. So, so I think that there's, um, you know, policy is going to be absolutely critical here. And unless we start putting a value on carbon and carbon emissions, it's difficult to see how you do transition. One of the, the difficulties that the bioeconomy faces is that it's usually just slightly more costly at the moment to produce a biochemical through a living organism platform than it is to derive it from oil. And so why or how do you persuade you know, a company like Walmart to invest a higher price in the plastic packaging technologies that, that it uses all the time, right? How do you get consumers to actually pay a premium uh, for something that simply has the same functionality as the oil-based product? And so I think that's, that's part of the creativity that's coming out in the bioeconomy now is materials with new functionalities, chemicals with new functionalities, polymers that can be uh, better in some fashion than existing oil-derived polymers. Now, I'll just give you one very simple example. So lignin is a component of biomass. It comes in different flavors. It turns out that if you add lignin to concrete, the flow properties of the concrete change, depending on what kind of lignin you add in. So there could be a benefit in different uh, circumstances for building different kinds of infrastructures for tailoring your lignin to a particular use. So, so I, think, I think it is driving creative thought, but if you're simply making a, re a straight replacement, then um, yeah, it, it's difficult to get an economic advantage. Maybe may, I, Luciano already talked about it, so Rakesh, maybe you could. Okay, so, so I, I think uh, the couple of things which are happening, which are very exciting, actually. Uh, first of all, the solar cell photovoltaic costs have been coming down. If you like, when when I was a graduate student, it was eighty-five dollars a watt, and today it is like seventy cents a watt. Okay, so all it is is going down for another by a factor of two, and it will be as competitive as anything out there. But the challenge is so. so it's, Getting the cost down, that's part of the research which we are also doing. To, like if you can print it like a newspaper on a fast and, and just make it as cheap as the newspapers, then imagine how cheap it would be. You just roll it in your own wherever you want, you just put it and do it. But I think the biggest challenge is the storage. Okay? And storage not for on a small scale, but storage to supply a city like Indianapolis or a city like Manhattan. Okay, so and a system which is because you can store oil in tanks, okay, and if you could store something of the same magnitude, so for example, what Professor McCain said, like if you could use the biology, if you can use the chemicals, and we can create a storage of a high energy density thing. So that would be, the day we do that, I tell you that the world is absolutely in the renewals, okay, we'll be swimming in that. And the second thing which I think is equally challenging in my mind is, is how do you make hydrogen a fundamental molecule of nature, okay, from renewal, okay? So we know how to make electrons from PV, okay? The day we learn how to make hydrogen and storage, we can do everything which we do with fossil. There's nothing which we cannot do. So in my mind, actually, those are the biggest challenges. Yeah. Khalif, can I, can I yeah, go ahead. I, and then I we're coming over to you, young man. Khalif, if you yeah. think about it, it, in Texas, for example, the cost of wind energy is very competitive to natural gas. So it's not so much, in some cases, the cost. Obviously, we need the policy but it's education. And I think people need to be educated that it's not just this environmentally, we need to be, I mean, I think that's important, but I think the other issues that we're gonna be dealing with in the long run, which is the, the water. But I think also having microgrids interconnected allows me to exchange energy. So a, a lot of the issues with the storage, I don't have to have such a big battery for that purpose. We have a question from over here on the, the right. Hi. Um, my quick, I don't know. Um, hi, I'm Cesar Guillen. Uh, I'm an electrical engineering student and president of the Latino Student Union. Um, so my question, uh, I was writing down my thoughts, so it's a little bit scattered, so please forgive me. Um, but basically, there's so many people on the planet that have uh, little to no access uh, to electricity, uh, like Jorge mentioned. Um, and I see that renewable energy is an opportunity to empower uh, those communities. And it's also an, um, 
opportunity to um, yeah, uplift them and provide um, financial, economic, uh, just so many opportunities. Um, I guess my question is, should energy, um, specifically renewable, be considered a luxury or a right mm. like to access? Like, I, th I feel like there, there shouldn't be a reason why people don't have access to electricity. I mean, the sun hits you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> so could you think of a more controversial question? <laughs> I'll give you a chance. I'm just joking. So may I? Maybe healthcare. We could do healthcare first I, and then I, energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, this is a, a, obviously a very personal thought. I think it's, it's, it's very dangerous to call anything a right. And um, I think there are some eco economic consequences to calling many things rights that we have seen through history. I, I would not go so much as to call it a luxury, but I would certainly think that it would be something that would be a privilege. The question is, how do we make that privilege available to every human being on the planet? And I think that regardless of what we call it, is something that as, as we as humankind should be committed to, that we give access <coughs> to the electricity and what that means. It means access to education, it means access to the internet, it means access to certain standard of living. Uh, but again, I think that uh, whether we call it a, a luxury, a privilege, or a right, is something that we should all commit to. Yeah. So I would... Well, and I was just going to say that the United Nations agrees with you, actually, <coughs> and that we're in the middle of the decade of sustainable energy uh, that Ban Ki-moon announced in 2014. And part of those sustainable development goals is <coughs> production of renewable energy, its access, and it's also affordability because it, you know, it doesn't help with access if, if it's too expensive to buy. So I, I think that you, the United Nations is absolutely with you because it is an issue of social justice. So, so what I would, I would add to you is, like, as a human being, when we are born, we all have at least certain rights to live comfortably. Okay, like, wherever we live, even the internet, the water, the, the medicines, the clothing, the everything, and that all is connected to energy. At the end of the day, when you look at all our needs, it, it is one common denominator that is fossil, which is energy. So I do believe that energy for us each as the people who live on this planet, okay, if we had an access to energy, everything else will follow. It's just a matter of fact that we have a desperate distribution of energy over the planet Earth, okay? So if solar has it certainly, and the wind, they certainly have a potential to democratize, okay, that distribution of energy across the globe, okay? So I truly believe, I happen to be with you, I truly believe that all of us who are born here and go through this journey in life, okay, have certain, should have certain access to energy. It is a absolutely, a, you call it privilege, you call it right, whatever you want to call it, but certainly it is a moment, the most important feature of the human existence. Very good. Maybe next question, please. Hi, hi, I'm Kate Kelsey, first year engineering. Last semester I was in a class and my professor made it clear that in order to make progress, you can't separate the engineering and policy, and so in order to get from where we are to where we want to be, how much do you guys think that's going to take policy work, and how much do you think it's gonna be engineering work? So both are needed, okay? So uh, the classical example is Venezuela, okay? A country which has so much of energy resources, and you can see what policy is doing to it, okay? And on the other hand, you see a country like ours, and you can see what policy is doing, okay? And you can look at a country like China, what their policies are doing. So for anyone else to think who are engineers, like people like myself, to go home and think engineering is the driver of the universe, that's absolutely wrong, okay? Like, we need to learn to dance with the policy makers, okay? And we both play equally important role for things to happen. Policies can accelerate things, okay? They can de-accelerate things, okay? So having the right policies and moving in the right direction is an absolutely fundamental requirement with the energy engineering. And actually, it's okay. policy that allows the access of energy, right? Going back to the previous question. So if we have the access to the energy, the access to proper incentive in places so everybody could have that 
availability of the energy, that means that the one billion people that don't have access to water will get the water. Same with the sanitation, so same with other issues. So it start, I think it starts at the root with the policy. Yeah, you can see it actually in the contrast between the European Union and the bioeconomy, because they, they have taken on board the reality of climate change, thought about greenhouse gas emissions, and now there's 20% renewables, both on the grid and into transportation fuels in the EU. And that contrasts with about 8% uh, for renewables in total uh, within the US. So there's a, a policy push that, um, that helps to <coughs> further enable new technologies to develop. Well, I, I, I don't think I could add anything to that except what comes to mind is the GPS. President Clinton was the one who made the decision to make the GPS available commercially before it was a military application. So the technology was there, the policy made it available to you and me in the, all, and the whole transformation that the GPS has, has created by one, one person, one president. Look at this issue, right? Policymakers will not make new policy friendly for any technology or anything unless young people like you do engineering and science and demonstrate that this given technology is more feasible. For example, the, the, the philosophy is that we're going to get more jobs with nuclear or coal or natural gas. That's not true but you could use science to inform them, right? And that's what is needed. But we also need you. We need you to put pressure on the government, on the pol politicians to adopt friendly measures such that you could have a better future. And that, that is the driver, right? We need that, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Hello, I'm Leon, a student here at Purdue University. I think President Haddock and Professor Castillo, you both pointed out how many more jobs there would be um, if we transform more and more to solar energy, right? Especially um, as compared to using fossil fuels, fuels right now. So could you just help me understand where these large number of jobs come from and also what type of jobs that would be? That's, a, that's an excellent question. And, and actually, like anything, any new technology, initially there will be a drastic investment in the infrastructure, right? So there's a lot of infrastructure on, on the solar system, the grid, uh, the energy storage. So a lot of those jobs will be there. The great majority, I mean, you see you're going to need people to install the solar panel. When you look at the average salary, that's way higher. I, I forgot what the number was, but it was in the mid-70s. Right? So, so a lot of these jobs are going to be shifting more into highly technical jobs, but there's still jobs in the installation, maintenance part. But like everything, and the disadvantage, I don't want to be unfair to natural and, and coal, is that those jobs are very automized. So as a result, you don't require so much a bigger uh, labor force. So every, every time you start something new, like a new construction, you're going to need a lot of that. So that's where that is coming. So in solar, you have way more jobs. Uh, com even compared to, to wind. So I think it's 24, 25, 24 for one job in the other areas. But it's the infrastructure. Very good question. Or so, you no, I mean, it's, uh, this is a conversation Luciano, you, Luciano and I had had, have had very often. I, I don't think there's anything I can add to that. And I think that the, the net gain is still to be determined. The net gain or the net the net loss, but I, I think that for most for most part, I would have to agree with the research is done. Anyone else? And I'll just say that in the biotech industry, then revenues have tripled in the last decade, and actually the workforce has tripled. Uh, but that is an instance where you need a very scientifically skilled workforce. Same will be true for, you know, as the photovoltaics evolve, like, you know, and, uh, and we design and make new systems. So we need all kind of distribution. The answer is, it's not just one kind of job, like people who make them, people who install them, people who transport them, people who maintain it. So there's a whole, and the microgrid. So I, I think same thing with biomass, those who grow it, those who harness it, those again who convert it. Like, so there's all skills of job which would be needed. That's the. You saw the issue, right? You get the job benefits, save the water, 
and then you don't have the, the footprint in the environment as big as the other one. Maybe we can switch over to this side of the room. Is that all right? I'll come. Is that all right? I'm not picking on you here. <laughs> all right. Hi, I'm Christian. I'm a civil engineering student. I have a good question here that I think would be a good follow-up. Um, the question is, many experts uh, in the energy, energy industry have suggested the use of a carbon tax to incentivize the use of alternative resources as opposed to fossil fuels. Uh, however, seen in the widespread yellow vest protest in France, the use of a carbon tax is shown to be ineffective to a certain extent. Uh, do you all believe that a carbon tax is feasible here in the United States, or should we seek another pathway to best incentivize the transition to renewable energy? Yeah, this is a good one for the engineers and scientists here. <laughs> sure. I know that we mentioned a bit about policy, so I was just curious if there was an engineering perspective. Well, I, I, I think that, I mean, this may not be answering the question directly, but I think, again, we, we go here into whether it's, it's the saving the environment or whether it's a financial decision. And I think in, in many of these cases, uh, it, for many people, it'll be about, about the environment and saving the planet. It's about the future generations. And for some people, it could be about, about the finances. I don't think that we'll ever be able to, to agree on this and have a consensus. But there is where the policy comes into place. What is the stand that we're going to take as a country? And are we going to make it about, about the finances? And in that case, it can come to fruition, but it may just take longer if we make it about, about the finances of, the, of either or. And I think, that's, as the professor said, that's the difference between our approach to policy versus the European approach to policy. I think one, one could also argue that implementing that uh, quickly tends to be a regressive tax with, in which the, the people at kind of the lower economic strata pay a disproportionately greater amount. So that's, that this gets hard, right? But I, I do think the incentives are, are necessary, right? And I, and I see when you look at, I look at renewable energy the same way I see, for example, fast food versus vegetarian food or, or very organic food. It's almost some, some similarities. In the organic food, it costs way more money, but in the longer run, one could argue it's probably healthier than the, the fast food. So I think not only does that exist in many, many areas, but I do think that's necessary to sustain that technology, right? And to bring new, new projects on it. And I, th I think one of the issues here is that it's um, very difficult, f even for economists, to put a value on what they call these externalities. That is sort of the, you know, the biodiversity in the environment, the, the cost of a polar bear. What is the value of a polar bear, right? And, and so until until we have a means of actually putting a value on what gives us our quality of life, as opposed to our standard of living, then um, then we're not going to see we're not going to see how that carbon tax or how that cap and trade will actually save us money, will actually be an economic benefit to us. Right, because we're, we're just not valuing many of the things that we should be valuing. Very good. Yes. Hey, guys. Ryan Benzik here. Uh, uh, ABE graduate, Dr. McCann, great to see you again. We had been, <laughs> I'd known you a few years ago, but uh, I work as a, with a LED manufacturer based in Florida, and um, so I'm a huge fan of, like, repurposing material and energy and putting it back into the grid. Uh, what kind of, so two questions. Uh, number one, what kind of challenges do you guys see with um, expanding like plant-based biomass type energy? Because there's, there's a difference between like corn ethanol and sugarcane ethanol, which <coughs> are a significant amount more of energy to produce. So like what sort of challenges do you see scaling up with um, as we start to think about more plant-based um, alternative options. And uh, part two is uh, Professor Castillo. Castillo, uh, kind of from your slide, uh, what would you do with $5 billion? So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I let Maureen answer the first. Okay, so, so there are huge issues in scaling up biomass production. 
And, and let me give you maybe a sense of what a billion tons is first. So if you take the entire agricultural output of the US, fruits, vegetables, grains, uh, uh, hay, pasture, it comes to about 800 million tons. So a billion tons of biomass is a larger agricultural economy than our existing food and feed supply, right? So that's, that's the first thing. The second issue is, of course, the land, water, energy, fertilizer needs if we actually simply grew biomass uh, on the land that we currently have, right? It would compete with food and feed. So one of the challenges is actually to dramatically improve the efficiency of biomass production and constrain it to the existing land area. So, so bear with me just for a, a quick thought experiment here that Rakesh is familiar with because he's been talking to my husband a lot about <laughs> this. But if you take the maize crop, the corn that goes to ethanol production, it's about 40% of the acreage uh, of maize. So we can do a thought experiment where we replace that maize with sorghum. And farmers know how to grow sorghum. They love it because it's an annual crop. It can go into a rotation cycle. We could triple the production of energy from that existing acreage overnight, just with that displacement of an existing crop. Then if we said, let's not use conventional sorghums, let's use some of the tropical varieties that give us double the yield, even out here, even at Purdue Acre, right? So now we're getting six-fold increase on that same land area. And now let me try and use my tricks and tools of genetic engineering to make some further improvements in droughts, resistance, in salt tolerance, in biomass yield genes, in, in convertibility of the biomass. And sooner or later, we're starting to think about production at a very large scale that isn't actually increasing that land use area. So, so, you know, this is a 150-year moonshot thing to do, uh, but it, I think it pays off for us in the long run. And I, I do think that we, we need to be thinking about our agricultural system in, in producing all of our needs, food, feed, uh, and fuel. So the, the five billion, uh, so one idea actually, and we started working. Use your mic. Oh. We started working with my friend Jay Gore and a group in the United States. And if you think about it, right, and, and we alluded to that in the entire Southwest, where he has excellent solar irradiation, you have a land that is, is propensity, it's a desert, and at the same time, you have very good wind resources. So this idea that we've been, not, not just, we've been actually, collaborating with many people. We're talking like 28 people right now in the United States. And the idea is that if you look at the resource of energy, you could actually build in the border the biggest technological corridor <laughs> in the world. And by that we mean that if you have, uh, you have access to the energy, you have access to fresh water, you could actually create an opportunity corridor where people in Mexico, people in the US could collaborate do farming, you could develop new technologies in institutes. Right? Imagine having every border a major institute where people come to the border to gain opportunities, to get trained, to, to learn about the latest research in irrigation in the desert. And now you could create a problem that could, and a problem in the sense that you could create tensions, right? But rather than doing that, you create a, a fertile playground for people in the borders to solve problems in the future. And what that means is that the first place people like to come is because of the opportunities, right? So you could create the opportunities in the border and, and using solar energy and wind, you could actually have enough energy equivalent to what you have in the hydroelectric in, 
in the north part in Canada. So, so this is something that we've been working with a group, and we're hoping that at some point we get to play with this. But it, it's not a joke. It's actually something that we're seriously working. We have a team from California, including Caltech, Stanford, Arizona State, New Mexico. We have people in, in Texas. And, and this is something that was born here at Purdue, discussing with colleagues how we could actually bring a solution. And we did it two years ago. But uh, when we were in the TSA, I won't talk too long, yeah, yeah. I felt bad that, that people were not getting paid. And I said, you know, look, we are sitting here. We could actually come up with a solution to help the country and everybody. And actually, this is something that Mexico will be excited because now you're take a looking at a desert. They could invest too and take also water and energy to grow their section as well. So that's what I would So we're, we're running out of time and, and we've got four... Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we've got four people left that want to a ask questions, so let's try to be brief. brief. <laughs> you now, you went already. You asked one question. I have uh, one more question, if that's okay. Well, why don't we let uh, the other young person here oh, of ask nope. first, and then we'll come back to you if we have time. I, I, I'm, I, do I come off as a jerk doing that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to give everybody a chance. All right. So you would be great finishing on time. Yeah. So my question is to uh, Professor Castillo. Uh, so regarding your concept of having that grid running through the country from coast to coast, what do you think about, about the feasibility of that grid? And if we come to uh, countries like Puerto Rico, how do you think this will pan out in terms of decentralization of energy supply? So the, the first part, how the grid will... The first part, is so the feasibility. Well, our first rough numbers, at least from the solar, using the solar energy, this is actually feasible. Actually, just using solar energy, solar panels, just two rows of it, you could actually, it, it is a very doable development. The, the challenge, and, and this is the part where one has to be very creative, how then you protect that, that, those cables, right? Like anything, you have to build some sort of uh, uh, a blockage for that, to protect that infrastructure from the animals or anything, right? Uh, but but the, at least the first rough numbers that we, we did, this is very, very, very doable. Uh, it, part of the challenge is, and I'm, we've been working with some of my colleagues, with David Wurzinger, is to do the, the reverse osmosis, the water desalination with renewable energy at a price that will be at least 30% lower than using any other means fossil fuel, for example. So, so, so th those ideas are there, Jay? Am I missing anything here? The, why don't, why don't we try to, yes. to get this question but, here? But these two, hurry, hurry, it is very hurry, 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 hurry. <laughs> All right. We could talk, we could talk, okay, if you want. Okay, so thanks to each one of the speakers for their talk. I think each one of you made really good points, but I, 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 uh -oh. am, luck I am lacking one point on each one of you, and it's how are cars and airplanes fueled in a 100% renewable world without putting water at risk, right? So I think that would be a question. So how can we go to 100% renewable without putting water at risk? No, with cars and aviation. No, cars, like yeah. airplanes. Uh, so there are many ways of doing it, actually. So if you are, like, the, when you're talking about transportation, things like car, we already know. We can use the hydrogen fuel cells, you can use electric cars, and so forth. So the question is jet fuels and, and like, you know, what is the replacement? And, uh, and there are many solutions, actually. Like, one of the solutions could very well be what Professor McCain said. You could be using the, sub, it's a very small fraction of the biomass of that billion ton, which would be needed just to make jet fuel. That's one possibility. And there are some far out solutions. We're talking about 2169. You could be using slush hydrogen. Just like you go to 7-Eleven, you buy slurpy, you have a slush, okay? And if you make a slush hydrogen, it is very dense, okay? It will take even less volume than currently taken by jet fuel. And it will take you to Tokyo or wherever you want to go. So there are many solutions out there, by the way. So what looks like an impossible task is really not. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm just, I want to ask a question more about the biofuel kind of biopower industry. Uh, so it sounds like it's a really promising idea, but I'm also wondering, because you're growing crops in order to fuel the biopower industry, how is that going to affect 
the nitrogen cycle because in growing plants, you're going to require nitrogen to produce them. So how can we do that sustainably if it's going to be taking out nitrogen and using fertilizer to produce them? So, so um, and Rakesh is laughing because uh, he and my husband have been brainstorming this idea about how you might use a fraction of biomass as your source of hydrogen for fertilizer production, right? So you would no longer be in a food versus fuel competition if you took 5% of your biomass and turned it into the fertilizer that allows you to increase yield on that other 95% of the acre. So I, I think you have a, a paper in the works. Yeah, and, and also that's the homework problem for my class tomorrow, So which is what I wrote this. Yeah, so don't say too much then, right, Rick? <laughs> so if you, if you have to, for those who are taking my class, <laughs> we'll see tomorrow. But, but you're quite right. Nitrogen is going to be an issue. Worse than nitrogen is going to be phosphorus. Yeah because we have a very limited supply of phosphorus, and we need that. Last question. All right, so um, on the road to uh, becoming 100% renewable around the world, um, we're obviously not going to get there overnight. So do you believe that uh, third world countries and first world countries currently share the same obligation to adopt renewable energies at the same time? <laughs> Some don't have option. Okay, I don't think it's just a question. Solar energy is, as I said, it is democratically everywhere. I, I just visited India two weeks ago. They don't have oil, they don't have natural gas, okay? A country of 1.2 billion people, right? Where is the energy going to come from? So I do not think it is a, it is a third world versus this world or that world. I, I think it is for everyone, okay? And some don't have choice. They have to take renewal because for them, Okay, like uh, the renewal, like for example, PV could be cheaper than importing natural gas or oil from a remote place, okay? Unlike us who have plenty of it. We are a very blessed nation, by the way, okay? And, uh, but that's not true for everyone, so. Actually, if you connect a network of microgrid, you bypass this issue of building this big grid, right? So, so this could be an opportunity for developing countries to go straight to more advanced technology at a lower cost with, addressing a lot of the problems we already have with the big microgrid, with the big grid, so. And, and this is, you know, it's the cell phone solution in Africa where you just leapfrog the technology issue. Hey, I wanna uh, just thank President Haddock, Professor McCann, Professor Castillo, Professor Agarwal. Let's hear it all for them. And thank you for a bunch of great questions, and thank you for joining us to, to learn and, and hear about energy and a sustainable economy and planet. Thank you all. <laughs>